All right, you know, in the world of show business, they always tell you never to act with children or animals. And now I'm going to add Chris to that list because he is impossible to follow. Was that fantastic? That was awesome, right? Well done. <laughs> He's definitely made it a hard job for me to follow. So I'm going to see if I can uh, be a little provocative tonight, tell you a little bit about my background and my story, and see where we go. And then I'm what's between you and dinner. So I might even keep it short. We'll see. Um, all right, the chief digital officer. How many people in this room know somebody with the CDO title? How many people in this room actually have the CDO title? A couple of you? No? Nobody? I kind of do, not really, because we don't have chiefs at MEC, which is soon to be Wavemaker. Everybody knows that, right? MEC, Maxis, Merger, soon to be Wavemaker in January. Everybody good on that? Clear? OK, good. That's why all my slides say Wavemaker. That's why my new title is President at Wavemaker. We can all talk about that over drinks and, and cocktails and maybe beignets later, because that I need beignets before I leave town. The chief digital officer, what is the chief digital officer? Do we still need the chief digital officer? So this is an interesting thought. 2013, we said it was the fastest growing position in the C-suite. Three years later, say goodbye. <laughs> really? What happened? What happened in those three years? Did we not prove our value? Were we not good enough to actually be in that room? What, what the heck happened in that time? I've had a lot of different titles in my, uh, in my career. Um, and, and I think my friend Pete Paguardo is in the audience somewhere. He can keep me honest on some of these. All right, so let's go back to the beginning. I was an executive assistant. Um, I think everybody should start their career at some point as an executive assistant. You learn a lot as an executive assistant. I was executive assistant to, uh, to Isabel Stevenson at the American Theater Wing, which owns the Tony Awards, which was a glorious position to be in, and I got to work with a lot of really amazing performers along the way. Had a moment where I asked Marissa Tomei her name. That was a little embarrassing. <laughs> <clears throat> she was very lovely about it, but still a little embarrassing. Um, Isabel taught me how to use thank you notes. Thank you notes being the most important thing she taught me along the way. I taught her what computers were. This wasn't, uh, this wasn't 1994 or anything. This was actually like 1997, 98. Um, I brought a f the first computer into the American Theater Wing. They didn't have one. I brought in a laser printer. That was really freaking cool. Their minds were blown. I brought them a fax machine. It was like the world had given over to the world of digital. And uh, I, I was sitting in Isabel's office, and um, I was taking dictation. Not good, because I don't actually know how to take dictation. So I was just writing really fast. Um, and she says to me, uh, I need to write a letter, a thank you note, um, to Carol Channing. And the note says, dear, dear Carol. Now I ask you, how do you punctuate dear, dear Carol? Because I have no idea. To this day, I have no idea how to punctuate dear, dear Carol. So I wrote dear, comma, dear Carol, comma, I think. And I went back and I printed it out on white paper because Isabel had this gorgeous stationery, beautiful, probably very expensive stationery. And I didn't want to waste it running it through the printer if it wasn't going to be the right thing. So I wrote it out on white paper and I printed it and I brought it to her office and I said, Isabel, what do you think? And she said, it's wonderful. Great. I go back to my desk. I print it on her glorious paper. I bring it back to her. I present her this glorious paper to sign. And she goes, this is great. Just take out the other deer. And I said, OK, well, then don't sign that one. I'll go print another one. And she goes, oh, no, no, darling. Isn't that the purpose of computers, is that you can move the word around on the page? <laughs> so yes, I introduced Isabel Stevens into computers. That led me <laughs> sideways to having an analyst position at a company called Spectra Marketing. Anybody familiar with Spectra? Now owned by Nielsen, Consumer Packaged Goods Research. Yeah, I started my life in, as an analyst. So much fun. I love the data. I love knowing where the data is going to take us. I love what the data can teach us about what we want to do. It's fantastic. All right, so then I'm at Spectra. I'm an analyst. And I get this phone call. Does anybody know John Santiago? No? Except for Pete? Yeah, all right. So John Santiago owns a media agency down in Miami called Media 8. At the time, he was working at an agency called Mass Transit. If anybody remembers Mass Transit, I'm one of the few people old enough in this room to remember Mass Transit. Oh, God, this is aging me quickly. Thank God for L'Oreal and good makeup. Um, all right, so I get this phone call from John, and he says, do you want to work in online advertising? And I said, no. And my husband said, you're crazy. It's the internet. It's the future. This is 1999. And I said, fine, I'll go spend a day with him and see what it's all about. 
I spent a day with him. I love John dearly. Um, he's a, a tough negotiator. For those of you who know him, you can probably confirm that he is a tough negotiator. I realized that I could probably negotiate a little bit more nicely than he could, at least at the time. He's calmed down a lot over the years. And so then John makes me this job offer to work as a, as a trafficker, at least initially, under somebody who's been an iMedia friends and family for many years, Michelle Burnham. So Michelle Burnham teaches me all everything I need to know about online advertising and how to do trafficking and double click and pulling reports and all of the digital side of the entire ecosystem. I know nothing else about media. I know nothing else about advertising. All I know is the world of digital. That's how I got into this business, trafficking. And then eventually being the account manager on this really amazing, amazing account that was spending a million dollars a week in 2000. Any guesses? Yeah, no, Alta Vista. Yeah, that was fun. Million dollars a week. Media metrics top 10. We were killing it. It was awesome. I made a lot of sales reps. Really rich. Um, you're welcome. So <laughs> I was on the wrong side of that, that exchange, clearly. Um, all right, so I'm running along with Alta Vista, and I'm having a grand old time as now a senior account manager at Mass Transit. The world shifts on its head. And I figure, hmm, this online advertising game isn't going anywhere. You know what's a good idea? Let's start an online advertising agency. You know when to start it? March of 2001. <laughs> yeah, great timing. Actually, it turned out to be phenomenal timing because every other agency was dealing with everything that was happening. On Remember the SMS messaging system called Fucked Company? <laughs> right? God, I miss that guy. Yeah, so we're watching everybody get laid off. I'm sorry for those of you that went through the layoffs during that time. We're watching everybody get laid off. We're watching the industry change around us. Everything is getting turned on its head. And here we are starting our own online advertising agency with the New York Times and Hertz Car Rental and ultimately Neiman Marcus. And before you know it, Morpheus Media is growing to 150 employees and well over 100 clients over the course of the 13 years that it existed. Very proud of it. Ultimately ended up selling it. Ultimately ended up moving over to MEC, as president of digital, de facto CDO. Now, with the merger of Wavemaker, still mm, getting out of digital. I'll explain that later. All right, so what happens to the CDO? Where does the CDO live? Does anybody remember meeting schedules that look like this? And sorry, I know this font's a little small. It was a two-hour marketing meeting. This is like 2002, 2003, and it was television for like 45 minutes, and then maybe it was print for a little while, and the radio, and like digital was the ass end of the meeting. And search was the ass end of the ass end of the meeting. Like nobody wanted to get to search. It was all the way in the back. And honestly, sometimes we as the digital agency were sitting out in the hallway waiting for the real agency who was in the room talking about television budgets to be done so that we could even come in. Because, you know, competitive separation, and they were building their own digital department, not that they really knew what they were doing when they were building their digital department. Don't get me fired with that. Um, so, where does digital sit now? This is the trend. If we go back to when I started Morpheus in March of 2001, and you fast forward, we are 10 times the size we were back then, and for many companies, and I'm sure you guys know this, digital is over 50% of the budget today, and growing. But what is digital? Because if I look at that television number, that 40.4%, aren't full episode players digital? Isn't OTT digital? Isn't everything I run on my Xbox and my PS3 digital? And what about magazines? Do I count the stuff that counts towards their ABC numbers but is still digital? Like, I don't know, what I watch on the iPad or going to their digital site or the digital editions? I think that's all digital, don't you? If I can track it, if I can tag it, if it can sit into my CRM system and ultimately into my, my DMP, I'm pretty sure it's digital at the end of the day. So all of those parts and pieces are melding towards that blue section, and there's gradients, if you will, of that blue in all of it. With, I was gonna say, and I'm gonna correct myself, I was gonna say with maybe the exception of billboards, but you know what? Billboards are now programmatic too. So all of it's getting connected. All of it's getting connected. So where does the chief digital officer sit? And more importantly, or maybe as importantly, what comes first? The creative execution or the media, the media choice? Because right now, or historically, I should say, we have sat around waiting for the media execution to come to us so that we could then figure out where we put it. And how many of you have sat in creative meetings where the creative agency, no offense to present company, has presented their anthem for the campaign, right? 
this 60 second, 90 second spot that is never going to air anywhere because nobody can afford that. And then we try to retrofit it into a 30 and then a 15 and then a six. And I'm sorry, if you can't tell the message with a hook and get me interested in six seconds, you've started at the wrong end of the conversation. And it's not just because I'm lazy or I'm flipping too fast or my thumb scroll speed is 5,000 pixels per second. It's all of that, but it's also that you're, at, I'm, you're competing for my attention. I'm all over the place. I've got a lot of other things going on. If you can't hook me instantly, you're wasting my time. I'm no longer stuck sitting in front of a television box waiting for the next section of my television show to air. That's all changed, and so digital again is reinventing how creative needs to come to market. Do you remember print ads trying to be shrunk down into 468 by 60s? Long live the 468 by 60. I miss the 468 by 60. It was a good unit, sad. All right, so where does digital live? Does it live with the chief marketing officer? Maybe. They're in charge of the brand, the marketing, the advertising, the promotions, the public relations, the market research, the customer service. I challenge you to tell me any of those pieces that don't have digital touch them, right? Does it sit with the chief technology officer or sometimes the chief information officer? This is the person in charge of all of the technology, in charge of the website design, the app design, the augmented reality design when it comes, the virtual, everything that the consumer touches on behalf of that brand goes through that chief technology officer. And yet all of those pieces, every single one of them has to have a digital component ultimately that ends up bringing it back into the DMP, that ends up bringing it back into the CRM, that ends up bringing it back to media. It all connects, one big long thread. Does it sit with the chief customer officer? Does anybody know chief customer officers? I know a few. It's getting to be a more popular title out there, chief customer officer. I like this job. Now this job doesn't always sit independently of the CMO. Sometimes it's a VP of customer relations or a VP of customer something or other. The chief customer officer is in charge of the CRM, the call center, the sales, the marketing. Well, what are call centers today? Isn't that just Twitter? I mean, my call center for Delta when I want something fixed is at Delta Assist, please fix this, right? Or actually, I think they even dropped the assist now and it's just now back to just at Delta, please fix this, right? How many of you find that you get better, faster customer service through Twitter than you do by calling, right? Absolutely. So isn't that all digital? Doesn't that all connect through digital? User interfaces, the user interfaces are what ultimately, again, drive to my CRM, drive to my DMP, et cetera, et cetera. What about this one? This one, I think I kind of made this title up, but we'll go with it for a second. Maybe this is the, the CMO of the, or the chief of the future, the chief analytics officer. Does anybody know anybody with this title? Because I don't yet. Couple? Cool. All right, so I didn't invent it, but it's out there. Chief analytics officer. I think this is going to get to be a very important role in the future because all of it is data. All of it is data, all of it is connected, all of that information comes to one big place, and this person is in charge of analyzing all of that data, online data, offline data, normalizing it, making decisions out of it, and delivering those insights back to the CMO, the understanding about what the, CM, the CRM team is supposed to do, what the technology needs to do next. That's a really important role. But back to our original question, where does digital live? Kind of lives in all of it, doesn't it? Where is media in this entire mix? Media ultimately ends up this conduit between all of these different pieces. So your chief marketing officer needs media in order to deliver the anthem message that they ultimately want to deliver. Your chief technology officer needs the digital media or all of the media ultimately in order to give them decisions on how to work with the technology and what technology to create next. And your CRM team needs digital in order to continue to build that database because let's be honest, you're not getting a database just by going around and interviewing the people that are buying your product at the bar, assuming you're a liquor, just throwing that out there. Every single one of these guys needs media and needs digital in order to create the connection between all of it. Everything is digital, all of it. And you guys are gonna end up talking about that over the course of the next two days. It's all digital. So here are the three questions I have left to ask you. 
What happens when it's all traded? What happens to our jobs, to the chief digital officers, to the media people, to the agencies, when all of the systems can just talk to themselves? Worse yet, what happens when it's all traded through blockchain and we don't need any of the middlemen anymore because nobody needs to be the clearinghouse? That's a big shift in our industry. And not to bring the mood down, because I think that's a tremendous opportunity for innovation, because, Chris, my definition of innovation, not that you asked, but I'll throw it out there anyway, is connecting new and existing dots, to connecting existing dots in new and interesting ways. So if we can take existing dots, which are all of the things we already know how to do, and connect them in new ways, which is essentially what blockchain is doing for us, right? It's taking existing dots, connecting them in new ways to create a faster ecosystem, then ultimately we can get to a faster way of delivering to our customer, and I'll talk to you about why that's important in a second. How do consultancies change the game? Anybody nervous about consultancies? Nobody's nervous about consultancies? Am I the only agency in the room? A Little bit? How many consultancies are in the room? Yeah, a few of you, you guys. I got my eye on you guys for later. No, the consultancies I think are really interesting, but let's be honest, they don't want to do what we do. Consultancies are really good at living up here. They come in and they answer a question the client has. So the client comes in and asks the question of, how much money should I continue to invest in search? Or how do I solve my ROI problem over there? And the consultancy comes in and they charge a really big six-figure, seven-figure number to help solve that problem over the course of six or seven weeks. They walk out and they say, here's your deliverable, congratulations, have a nice day. But they don't want to do the ad trafficking, they don't want to do the reporting, they don't want to do all of the heavy lifting that we do in the media buying process, and also, let's be honest, have the, the risk that goes along with that, right, of the campaign going wrong or something not being tagged correctly or the impression serving in six hours when they were supposed to serve over six weeks. Those things happen in our industry, right? So they don't want to have those risks along the way. They want to sit up here, answer the question the client asked. So then what happens with the agency? Because they're making the profit margins, let's be honest. I think we have a tremendous opportunity as agencies. I think we have a tremendous opportunity because we actually sit on all of the data that they need in order to answer those questions. And they are answering questions that the client is asking. But we're integral to the client's business. And if we're truly in that business every single day, if we know our client's business as well as they do, as well as the client does, we ultimately have the opportunity to answer the questions that the client doesn't even know they should be asking yet. And that's a tremendous opportunity for us to get ahead of the consultancy world and actually help solve problems for our clients. So I think instead of sitting around getting nervous about all the consultants that are coming in trying to steal business from us, we need to actually be the consultants for our clients that are answering the questions they should be asking as opposed to the benign questions that they seem to be asking the consultants. No offense to present company. This one I don't have an answer for. What's the next C-suite executive? I don't know. I think it's gonna be really interesting because the chief digital officer is not going to continue to exist. Heads of, digitals at, at, of digital at agencies are not going to continue to exist. Because like we said, it is all digital. So fast forward, I'll tell you where I think that chief digital officer is going when we get to the, the end of this presentation, but I don't think they're ultimately going to be there in the future. So one more thing before I, uh, before I completely close. Is anybody familiar with the Ritz-Carlton mantra? My Ritz-Carlton, I hope there's some Ritz-Carlton staff in the room. Ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen is how they start their mantra. They have one of the best, ultimately, service values of any organization out there. There's training courses that you can take to be certified in the Ritz-Carlton service value, so it's only fitting that we are in this room. But as Chris was telling us earlier, what that innovation brings us, connecting all of those dots, getting us into that place where we are ultimately solving client uh, customer issues and being of the moment, of the zeitgeist, if you will, I think we have an even more interesting opportunity there that I will layer on to what Chris said before. We are finally in the position with enough data to be able to know that 
Scott, my visual guy, is in the back, lives here in New Orleans. I'm not calling on you, Scott. You're all good. Lives here in New Orleans. I know who he is. I know where he lives. I know he's in the market for a new Apple computer because it'll allow him to delete slides from PDF faster. We talked about that earlier. I know that he's in the market today and that I can spend a $50 CPM on him because he'll convert today and that'll be an amazing return on my investment on a $1,500 machine. I can get you the right person at the right time, in the right place, in the right context, finally for the right price. I can answer all of those questions. So what's the one piece that's missing? The right message. And that's the challenge I have to our creative partners, is how do you help me get to the right message so that I can connect all of those dots and finally deliver on exactly what our industry should be delivering on, which is advertising as a service. At the end of the day, if you are a customer, I should be of service to you. No ad should ever be annoying. No ad should ever be breaking you up between what it is you want to see and what it is you want to do because it should be the right ad for you in that moment at the right time because it's the right thing you need. And if we can solve that problem, we can get out of this space where everybody looks at the advertising industry as, oh, God, those people with pop-ups. When was the last time we ran a damn pop-up? I still get accused of pop-ups. It's been forever since I've run a pop-up. I swear it's not me. Or my friends who ping me and say, oh my gosh, this ad is following me around the internet. And I'm like, good, call that company and tell them they need a better advertising agency because at least I know how to suppress segments. Come on, we can do better. Good grief. Advertising as a service. All right, so what happens to the CDO? I think the CDO is still a very important talent, but they're not gonna be stuck in digital anymore. They're gonna be people like me, and like Jonathan Adams, who I'm replacing tonight, so I'm hoping I did him well. And we're gonna take this opportunity to go from being digital only to showing you that digital is part of everything, and I think we're gonna start to move into the CMO spot. And I think that's where digital leaders are gonna go next. That's my time with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Don't go anywhere. You, you have to be up there for Q&A. And Scott, you need to put your Instagram on private. Um, so, by the way, guys, if you have the app, it is not connected to your Tinder, so we won't get your personal information, but please <laughs> use it. Uh, you can ask questions via the app um, anonymously, as long as they're not rude or uh, intrusive. But let's get to some Q&A uh, for Shannon. Thank you again. That was awesome. Um, oh, and a curtsy, a curtsy even. You have to have a question for somebody who curtsies. That's just, that's just status quo. Um, I grew up in Texas. We're good at the Texan oh, dip. The, the Texan you can dip. YouTube that later. Even, even better. Uh, first question, anyone? Anyone? Yes. All right, here we go. When do we chief out? When do we chief out? As yeah. in no more chiefs at all. I mean, we, we just, more we, Indians? I work for a video game company called Zenga, and we just hired a yeah. chief legal officer. Oh. I've got a chief privacy officer, I've got a, a chief data analysis, counsel? I've got a chief operating officer, a chief, we don't have a chief revenue officer. Oh yeah, that'd be good. Well, you we've got a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, chiefs, not enough Indians. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good question. I do, well, so I have a challenge with that, I, and I fully agree with you, I think there are too many chiefs. Um, but that, I, all right, so I'm, I might be a bit controversial here, but I think that's more of an ego problem than it is an industry problem, right? Like. I want to be the chief legal officer. You know what? The general counsel is a chief executive, right? It's the same title. It's just general counsel. I only know this because my husband's a general counsel and has been for many years. Don't hold that against him. Um, he's now in culinary school, so he's a recovering general counsel, um, which is amazing for me because he cooks all the time. Um, no, so, yeah, I, th I do think we're going to chief out. I think we're going to end up with, with too many of those leaders and not enough doers. It's also why I think the chief digital officer has to go away. Because if the chief digital officer goes away and it becomes digital is through everything, you don't, that's one less person you need in the room. I want, think one of the things that I think is interesting as I was going through this topic a little bit, not all of those chiefs sit on the executive committee anymore. And I think that's fascinating. Clients with chief customer officers who aren't part of the executive committee, they report into the CMO. 
again, I think it's more of an ego play and how do you give somebody the right promotion. But I think it's a, it's, it's a good challenge. All right, question number two. I'm creeping up from the back. You guys can't be that How are you easy. Doing today? Good. Oh, fantastic. Okay, good. Oh, here we go. All right. Sorry to bother you. Hi, Ann Hi. Frisbee from Imobi. Hi. Um, I'm curious. You talked about, um, you know, that one-to-one -one marketing with yeah. our AV guy Joe, as the example. I've heard um, kind of arguments on the flip side, right? Which is measurement and digital's just way too complicated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, it's kind of been the year of maybe the last big hurrah of television, right? Where TV's nice and simple and it's only on a panel and maybe digital's kind of gotten things wrong a bit. And we need to go back to a panel and reach and frequency and forget this kind of one-to-one -one marketing vision and yeah. too much overload. So I'm curious of your perspective of that trade-off between maybe simplicity and you know this one-to-one -one kind of vision. So on behalf of myself and those of us that have been in the industry since uh, 99 and, and thereabouts, the old timers, if you will, I apologize. Um, I apologize because one of the things that allowed us to make this industry as big as it is today was by selling it through saying you can track it. And that was the big selling point, right? We said, yeah, 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 television, billboards, but do you know somebody's actually in the room? I know when the banner loads on the page. I know they clicked on it, and I know they went to your site. Now, granted, in 2008, I had a woman come in. This is 2008. I'm just going to say that one more time. 2008, I had a woman come in and tell me that she could get a banner on her website that would click through to my client's site. Whoa, that's amazing. I've never heard of that before. Um, she was very sweet. She also tried to sell her son to one of the girls that worked with us as a date. That was a whole other problem. So. <laughs> so many stories. So um, yeah, I, ap I apologize because it is one of the challenges that, that we've created is that we made everything trackable. We came through with all of these promises and in all of those promises of making everything trackable and through the effort of making it all trackable, we've actually overcomplicated it in many places and I completely agree with you there. The challenge becomes, uh, if anybody remembers, DoubleClick just restated how they, how they uh, accept an impression today or how they measure an impression uh, this year or last month or last week or whatever, right? So all of a sudden now it's actually gonna be on the load as opposed to on the ad server call. That ad server call has been in place since like the 90s. So that's a huge shift that we just, how do we agree on this is the way you measure this and this is the way you measure that and that's part of our problem is that there's a lot of disagreement and a lot of lack of standards throughout all of those pieces. I do think measurement's gonna continue to be an important piece of it. I don't think we can over measure, I think we can over complicate how we measure. And it's going to come down to the simplification of the measurement. The challenge that I want to challenge my clients with is understanding if you're measuring for measurement's sake or if you're measuring for something that's actually going to get to you to value. And I think that's a question we all need to ask our clients over and over again. Are we doing this because you just want to see what the click-through rates are, or are we truly gonna get some value about understanding what the click-through rates are? Because the fact of the matter is, I don't think we're gonna get a lot of value out of the click-through rates. I also don't think we're gonna get a lot of value out of doing 30 markets around the country on a $2,000 budget where we're splitting it across 30 different markets. That's not gonna tell me anything that I can actually learn against, right? So making sure that we're actually measuring for value that something that's gonna teach us something as opposed to just measuring for the hell of it is a, is a big challenge. And that, I think that's something we need as an industry to talk more about is how do we simplify that process. All right, we now have a question from the app. Our first Ooh. question from the app. Cool. How slash who will drive the decision porcus? <laughs> spell check, there's no spell check in the app. And, oh, and what data is critical to make decisions? This is not helpful to, to the dyslexic. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, what was the first part of the question? Can we go back to the first part? Who's going to drive the, de uh, who's going to make the decisions, I think? And what's critical to making the decisions? Does and that porcus. Sound right? the porcus. Uh, yes. Who will drive the decision <laughs> process? And part two. Yeah. Part, I, okay, so, you got it. my prediction on who's going to drive the decision. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Nick's makes some really great pore cover cream. Uh, 
talk about that later. No, uh, my, my, my uh, thought on who's going to drive the decisions, I think as you see your uh, CMOs become more digitally led and more digitally focused, your CMOs are going to start to drive that decision process. I am now seeing CEOs take a much bigger step forward into media and marketing, much more than they have before. I've got CEOs that I sit down with today of major companies who can talk to me about DMPs and know what the difference is between a DSP and an SSP. That's impressive for a CEO. That's not something I normally expect from that level at the C-suite. So, and I'm not talking about technology companies. I'm talking about you know, consumer packaged goods companies. So that's an, I think that's an interesting step forward. Um, so I think you're going to start to see some of the CEOs and certainly the CMOs as they become people with digital backgrounds and digital leaders be more critical in the, in the process. What are the data points that are critical to making those decisions? Everything we can measure. Everything. As long as you're remembering to put customers first. At the end of the day, it is about solving a customer problem. And I go back to that point of we are at your service and how do we be at your service using the data points that make it a better experience for the customer at the end of the day. That's what we have to measure. Thank you. Shannon, one more Texas dip. You have one on you, another question. You want it or no? Oh, we, I was told to not, oh, not, not honor I'm that question. I but, I mean, who wants to eat? Who wants to listen to this question? Um, wow. So, <laughs> it's a choice. Um, That's just just, get, just give us the brief answer. So I love that you challenge the creatives as a media person. But I have a question, because uh, creative could be programmatically bought or made. Yep. Where does the idea live? Where does, ooh, where does the idea live? So I do, I do still think the idea still lives with the creatives. I really do, because there is a special talent that comes from that type of vision, that type of creativity, that opportunity to be of the moment, but also of the future. And I think, I think the creatives have a tremendous future there. What we need to do is help upskill them to the world of digital so they understand the medium that they're working in because a lot of them are still stuck working in that anthem spot. And if we can upskill them to the stuff that Chris is seeing out in the market, to the stuff that we're playing with on, on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, they're gonna have, they need to be open to a whole new medium. Now you can do the Texas dip. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>